Hello, how are you? This is Dr. A. We are going to cover the chapter on eukaryotes. So again, just this is going to be highlights of this chapter. Uh, information I think is relevant. So first of all, what do you think eukaryote means? So you're welcome to look up the definition. Um, and you can, if you've had medical terminology, you can see the word parts in there. And so um, what does it mean? And what if you had to literally translate eukaryote, what would what would that be? Okay, so let's look at a um, typical eukaryotic cell. So again, this is kind of like a, a composite cell. And um, in the last couple of lessons, we were talking bacteria. And we did, uh, in the first lesson on bacteria, cover the typical bacterial cell. And so it's here. So it gives you, I want you to see the size relationship of a bacterial cell, a prokaryotic cell in relationship to a eukaryotic cell. Okay, so the eukaryotic cells are the cells of our body. Okay, so we are eukaryotic organisms, so are cats and dogs and pretty much all mammals, um, insects, you know, all complex organisms like that are eukaryotic. They are eukaryotic organisms that are single-celled organisms. Um, yeast, fungi, and all that are, are some of these. And um, we're going to look at some of these there. Um, so this is probably just a review of more of anatomy because this is um, very similar to what you would have studied in anatomy one when you looked at a typical cell. So um, for starters, the eukaryotic cell has a cell membrane. And occasionally, you might see some that have a cell wall. Um, and that would be more like the, the fungi and yeast and stuff like that. The, um, the eukaryotic cells in our bodies do not have cell walls, okay? But they, everybody, uh, every eukaryotic cell has a cell membrane. The cell membrane will contain the cytoplasm, okay? Occasionally, you can have um, a flagella attached to um, that eukaryotic organisms, and you can also have things like cilia. Uh, attached to it um, on around the surface. If you go inside, you'll have obviously the cytoplasm. There are also going to be uh, the cytoskeleton, uh, very much like the prokaryotic cell. They'll be dotted with ribosomes, little dots here all over, very much like a prokaryotic cell, and there'll be some vacuoles and lysosomes and stuff like that. After that, it starts being different. So, um, you will see things like a Golgi apparatus, which um, refines the proteins that have been made by the endoplasmic reticulum, which is located here by the nucleus. Um, the endoplasmic reticulum, um, the rough one is dotted with ribosomes. Uh, ribosomes make proteins. So when manufacture a lot of proteins, those proteins can be modified here in the Golgi apparatus to add a glucose or another, you know, maybe a magnesium or zinc or something to it, right, and then released in vacuoles. Um, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum will be in charge of processing and making lipids, lipid, lipid type molecules, okay? Uh, and these have membranes. And so that is a big difference between eukaryotic and uh, prokaryotic organisms is that the eukaryotic organism have membrane-bound organelles such as um, the nuclei, the, cyto, um, the uh, mitochondria here in the cytoplasm, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, uh, chloroplasts, and things like that. So these are things within the cell that are also encased in the membrane or have a membrane, even if it's just like a, these folds here. Um, so some of them can have chloroplasts, like algae and stuff like that. Um, the human cells don't have chloroplasts, but other eukaryotic cells will. Um, they will have mitochondria. The mitochondria provide um, energy in the form of ATP for the cell. The mitochondrial production in your prokaryotic organisms happens across the cell membrane. Here, it happens across the folds of the mitochondria. Then there are things like centromere that uh, function in cell division. And then, of course, the all-important nucleus here, which is contained here in the nuclear membrane. Uh, there's a nucleolus, um, a site of a lot of the ribosomal RNA and all that production. 
and then your genetic material would be contained here in the nucleus. So you'd have chromosomes and chromatin and stuff. So that's a quick overview, again, um, very much a review of probably what you've learned in Anatomy 1. So let's start by looking at a case. So you have a 25-year-old woman that goes to her family physician complaining of itching and irritation down there with a burning sensation while urinating and a thick, white, odor-free vaginal discharge. She recently had a strep throat infection and was on a course of cephalexin antibiotics, which she had just completed. So um, if you're a female, you probably can really relate to that or know a female that has probably experienced these kinds of symptoms. They are quite common. So what would you be your first guess as what's going on with this patient? What is causing this infection? So put your gut answer there, your instinct. And the organism that is causing her infection is Canada albicans. So um, this is what it would look like. Uh, so if you took her urine, you would see this. So in her urine sample. So this is not stained. So this would be a wet mount. So um, the organism can see uh, reflect in here with the light. And you can see it's circular. And uh, it's in little chains here. So it's actually what we call a budding yeast. So if you had guessed that she had a yeast infection, you would be correct. Um, and so this is a hallmark budding yeast of a uh, yeast infection. Most yeast infections are caused by candida albicans. Um, if you look on a gram stain, you would see it like this. So in, on this slide, they kind of look like cocci. So you might look like this might look like staph to you. If you don't realize that this slide is actually at 400 X magnification and not at the thousand X magnification. And so when we looked at uh, last time, at the gram positive cocci in clusters that was staph aureus, we were looking at a magnification of a thousand X. Um, and so this is not as magnified. So if you're, if you don't pay attention, you could mistake it. But now let me show you the next slide, give you a little bit better. So I added this picture in here to give you the, the, the kind of size relationship. So here, these guys here are the budding yeast. Okay. And you would call these budding yeast on this uh, gram stain of the vaginal swab. These guys here are your, um, there's some rods here, but they're in chains. You can't even see where they're demarcated, but these are more than likely like lactobacillus right there. They're gram positive rods in chains. So you can see these little lines here. These are rods. And, and if you can really strain, you can see little dots here, right there. Those would be cocci. So um, these right here, maybe it's some little groupy strep or something like that. And these little bitty dots and these little bitty short rods and maybe there's a couple of dots here. You can see the size difference between these little guys, which are cocci and bacteria, right? Cocci, rods, bacilli, um, right there. Whereas this is way bigger and that is a budding yeast okay so when you look at it all together on the slide you can really tell the difference this this magnification is a thousand x because you can actually see the bacteria okay this thing will catch up with itself here you pause it okay it caught up with itself Okay, so how would you describe the slide? So enter your slide description here. You can always go back if you need to because this is self-paced. Okay, so um, here is a typical budding yeast, a fungal yeast cell. Um, and we tend to refer to it at yeast um, if it has um, this budding yeast form, which will happen if you grow it at room, uh, not room, at a body temperature. If you grow this at room temperature, it'll form halfy and uh, more like fungi, mold looking things, okay? So um, this is budding yeast. Again, they make uh, these, what we call pseudo halfy, which are chains of budding yeast. Um, they, uh, so they duplicate by duplicating uh, the, the DNA and all of that and the nucleus and, and a lot of the structures get duplicated and put in here in the little bud in miniature form and then the bud grows and grows and grows and becomes full 
grown, like you can tell here, and then forms itself another bud, and you get buds like that, and you get chains that form. Okay, so uh, a typical um, yeast fungal cell so will have a bud, will have ribosomes, mitochondrial, a cell wall, again, that's pretty typical yeast, a cell membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, the nucleus and the nucleolus, um, the storage, va storage vacuoles, and the Golgi apparatus at the very least. Okay, so was her history significant in this case? So if you remember when we were reading, we were talking about her having hit, had a history of strep throat and having uh, been on a course of antibiotics. So do you think this is significant, yes or no? Okay, so how do you get fungal infections? Um, in yeast, infections are a type of fungal infections. Okay, so there are three types of fungal diseases in humans. There are community-acquired infections that spread from person to person. There are environmental pathogens in the general population, and that can also, uh, so it can come from the environment, and stuff like that. And then there are hospital-associated infections that are caused by fungal pathogens. Um, there are things such as harmless spores that can cause what we call opportunistic infec infections in AIDS patients, but also in chemotherapy patients. So anybody that is, um, has their immune system compromised could get um, an opportunistic infection by some of these fungi that just normally won't cause any problems in your average healthy person. Yeast can grow if the pH is altered by the destruction of normal bacterial flora from antibiotics. So this is what happened to our patients. So um, every woman ha you have, any, actually every man, everybody has a certain amount of yeast in your body that is just part of your normal flora. But the thing with the yeast is it is kept in check by your normal flora, your normal bacteria, if that is plentiful. Uh, antibiotics kill bacteria and they can kill the normal bacteria and because it's not, you know, the antibiotics, you know, they kill the bacteria that were causing strep throat for her, but they also um, will kill other bacteria that are um, not harmful, that are actually beneficial to you. So that can be a big problem. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's a good practice if you've been on antibiotics to take some probiotics uh, or eat some um, fermented foods and stuff to kind of replenish your stores of bacteria uh, that are normal in your body. And so, um, you know, hers got knocked down, her normal flora got knocked down by that course of antibiotics, which allowed then the yeast to have free reign over the resources and to grow out of control and cause a yeast infection. So there you go. Uh, and that is quite common. And then, um, and there's another thing, another way too, where you can get sick, where it's not specifically a fungal infection, although it can happen if um, candida or um, other fungus like grow out of control in your body. Candida again is the most common, um, and um, they those those cells themselves can give off um, substances that can cause allergies, but. What we're really thinking about here is thinking of um, like black mold in a house. If you've had um, a plumbing leak or something like that, and mold can grow everywhere. Mold lo loves wood and sheetrock and stuff like that, and so they can grow in those environment, and then they can put off toxins that are that go into the air that you breathe, and those toxins make you sick. Uh, and they definitely can cause really heavy allergy symptoms. And some people are just more sensitive to these than others. So it's, it's not unusual for like maybe one or two person in a family to be affected and the others not be because genetically there's about one fourth of the population that is way more sensitive to um, these substances that are given up by uh, mold and um, they can make you really sick. Um, so here is um, another form. So we talked about vaginal yeast infection. This is thrush. Thrush. I'm sorry. Thrush. Thrush is an oral yeast infection, and it can happen just as well after a course of antibiotics. You could get thrush also. It's the same mechanism. So you have bacteria in your mouth all the time that is supposed to be there, 
and the antibody can kill it and cause the yeast that's in your mouth to take over and make all these white patches um, and they'll be on your tongue or you know inside the mouth um, if you pull the t lip it'll be like inside the, the mucusy part of your lip and stuff like that uh, and it's it's not pleasant at all um, it actually hurts and um, makes it hard to eat and stuff um, and of course um, what you want for that is nice statin um, some rinses that you gargle and stuff and, uh, and you can also um, well you gargle it and stuff and it helps clear it up so uh, another so the opportunistic one here are histoplasma although uh, most people can be affected by histoplasma especially if you work around chickens and stuff but also if you work around fields because they can spread manure from bird droppings and stuff that on as fertilizers on fields and you can inhale the these histoplasma spores that are part of that manure um, so anyway if you're somehow exposed to bird or bat droppings you can inhale histoplasma spores for most people it will cause just this harmless lung infection and it'll scar up your lungs and you may not even know it until you've had a chest x-ray but if you're immunocompromised it can actually set up kind of a nasty infection um, and if you don't think you're exposed to uh, bird bird droppings at the very least I'm just gonna ask have you ever washed your car okay because you'd be washing a bird droppings off your car and you could be potentially inhaling histoplasma spores off of that and it is endemic in this area which means it's common in this area okay if she didn't have a yeast infection what other eukaryotic organism could ca have caused her symptoms so those are her symptoms of that itching and vaginal discharge and all of that so let's say she never had strep throat she didn't take an antibiotic and all that but she just had those vaginal symptoms then what could have caused that and so we're gonna move out of the yeast fungi and go into parasites uh, protozoans and stuff like that so think of a parasite that can cause an std if you have if you know what it might be then enter it here and i'll show you what it is ta-da it is trichomonas vaginalis okay so these little guys are a little bit bigger than a white cell so um, they when you stain them this is what they look like um, if you look at it uh, under the microscope it actually looks um, like a white cell with a flagella that can swim around uh, it's quite interesting and um, let me actually go back and find you one I'm gonna pause this video for a second okay so I took a minute and uh, hopped on YouTube here sorry I didn't have that earlier but um you can see it here you can see how it's flopping around uh you see the flagella moving i know she's changing the magnification so much she's recording this but you can see how it has purposeful movement and there's a flagella uh that's um whipping around and so there's several of them like all of these are see how they're all beating the little flagella right here yeah this is what trichomonas would look like in um a urine all right so you see these little flagella flip flopping around and stuff very um, purposeful movement um, and so uh, again this is another one here just, you can see the flagella movement right here and a white cell just wouldn't do that um, and so that's what it would look like if you if you looked at it and you had a urine sample so I'm gonna pause that for now I'm going to there you go get out of that and go back to our thing here okay so stain this is what they look like you can see that same kind of symptoms is quite common uh, honestly when I worked um, I worked a lot of weekends and and there probably was not a weekend where we just didn't see at least one of case of these um, of these guys so so let's move to our next case so our next case is a 15 year old football player is seen by his family physician because of suspected athlete's foot he reports not wearing his shower shoes in the locker room his feet are red itchy and peeling this is what athlete's foot will look like it is extremely itchy and um, so what do you do you know what organism causes a condition that we refer to as athlete's foot okay 
So one of them, one of the most common for sure, is trichophyton rubrans. So the trichophyton here is the species, uh, and it causes tinea pedis. So tinea pedis is the medical term for athlete's foot. So foot, pedis, and then tinea having to do with actually this uh, fungal type of infection. Um, and so this is what uh, fungi look like. So you, you do have a few little budding, little yeast things in here, but you see these high feet, right? These long branches and stuff. And so that's typical of fungal infections is, is their high feet and a little yeast forms and stuff. Okay, so next question, um, where do fungi live? So do you know? Um, and if you can answer it for the case, if you will. So where do you think that athlete might have picked up um, that fungus, right? Or where could you pick up the fungus? So where do fungi live? What does um, fungus live? Anywhere they want to. They can literally survive in any kind of environment. Um, the more um, moisture and warmth they have, the better they live. But they can live uh, from one pole to the next, right? Like from North Pole to South Pole through the tropics in any kind of environment. Uh, they don't have to have us to survive. They can live uh, on in the soil and trees and animals on surfaces anywhere. They even like, uh, they can even eat and break down like rubber and stuff. It's crazy. So um, they wear, live anywhere they want to. They spread by skin to skin contact and con touching contaminated surfaces. Um, for athletes, food, warm, moist shoes would probably be the, the most common. Uh, shower areas that are shared, uh, if you're walking around barefooted and you're not using shower shoes, they can very easily spread there. Um, it, because it, all it takes is one person walking across that has it, and then it has a home now on the surface, and then somebody walks across and then they can pick it up. It's very easy. So it's easy to spread in gym areas also. So um, there are three species of fungi that uh, can cause all the different um, human fungal infections. So trichophyton is one of them, microsporum is the other, and epidermophyton is the third one. So there's all species or specific genus uh, on there, but you don't have, if you just learn those three, that's fine. So ringworm, uh, it looks like this. It is not a worm, it is a fungal infection, uh, and it develops in the top layer of your skin. And you see this red circular rash, um, uh, with clearer skin in the middle, it's usually itchy. Uh, and a ringworm gets its name because of its appearance. Uh, no actual worm is involved. Um, it is also called tinea corporis. So again, tinea for this athlete's foot, uh, not athlete's foot, this fungal thing, and then corporis for the body. So um, ringworm of the body, of course, is closely related to athlete's foot, which is tinea pedis. Jock itch, because it's just tinea cruris uh, for the like um, groin area, right? Um, and ringworm of the scalp, which is tinea capitis. A ringworm often spreads by direct skin to skin contact with an infected person or animal. Um, and so, yes, so if they, their itch, it's on their skin and they're itching all that and it's in their hand and then touch somebody else that person you know could get it and so kids can very easily spread it from kid to kid um with uh the tinea capitis in the scalp if you if you share a hairbrush or a comb which is why at barber shops they have to put whatever to use in that uh, liquid the blue liquid that kills all that stuff is so that it doesn't spread from patient to patient uh, from patient from client to client right um so again the fungal organism that cause causes tinea which are the uh, fungal infections that affect humans belong to genera trichophyton, microsporum, and epidermophyton. Okay, so um, I thought I would just go ahead and highlight this. This is um, not super common, but it's endemic apparently in our area. So if you remember, uh, this was back in 2013. There was an Arxa girl who <clears throat> ended up getting a brain-eating amoeba and survived, she survived it. I've actually 
met the team uh, in Little Rock, Little Rock that, um, you know, got her case, got her sample, and properly diagnosed her. And that proper diagnosis is what saved her life because they were able to get her uh, the medication that she needed to survive because otherwise it's pretty much fatal. So her name is Callie Harding. She was 12 when it happens. What happened? Uh, so she got a brain eating amoeba by swimming in Willow Springs Water Park in Little Rock. Um, and um, so again, she was, you know, it's just a fluke thing in a way that it happened. If it, you know, it just grows there. It's not, it's a, you have to think there, it's like a natural water park. So um, it's not like um, it was negligence on the park of the parks or anything like that. It just, it just, you you don't know. And if it's endemic in the area, that is uh, what can happen. So um, this uh, form of meningitis, parasite type of meningitis, is caused by what we call Negleria fowleri, an, an amoeba. So amoebas are single cell organisms um, and this amoeba, uh, it can live in fresh water and it's a commonly found microbe lives in fresh water and it lives in the soil and it's only dangerous if it enters through the nose and makes its way to the brain. And of course there it can cause an infection and makes the brain swell called meningitis uh, and death usually occurs around five days after the first signs of sim symptoms in 99% of the cases. So she was super lucky to actually survive. So just checking to see if you're paying attention, which organism caused her brain infection. So these are all um, protozoans that I have listed here. And hopefully you picked the right one. It's Nagleria fowleri. So um, these are just an electron micrograph of what it looks like. We can't, when we do, um, so like in the lab, this is what she would have seen. So she would have run the lab tech would have um, run a stain on her spinal fluid and uh, there was a lot of white cells. So these are all the white cells. If you can see these are all neutrophils with some macrophages here uh, and there's an abundance of them. And then you're like, what the heck is this thing? Because it is not a white cell. And so if you have a trained eye as a lab tech, you're like, wait a second, this guy doesn't belong. And this is what they found. Um, and they were able to report it and confirm that with her symptoms and everything that indeed it was not Gleria Fowleri and get her on the proper treatment really quickly. So as the article stated, um, how do you get a brain eating amoeba like not Gleria Fowleri? All you have to do is swim around in fresh water that's contaminated with the, the trophozoite form of that amoeba. So the trophozoite is the, um, free living, uh, it's, so it's usually, it's warm out, you know, it's surviving, it's doing really well in that fresh water, and you incidentally, it's not trying to come and infect you, right, it's not seeking you out or anything like that, but incidentally, you get water up your nose, and it can burrow its way through and, and make its way into your brain, and then once it gets into the brain, it starts eating away at the brain and poking holes in the brain which of course causes meningitis and uh, that is also what causes death often. Now uh, we'll talk about the cyst form here in just a second. And so uh, protozoans, uh, amoebas are protozoans, so these are our single-celled organisms um, and they are 65 thousands of these guys, of these protozoans, uh, different, different species. So Nagleria fowlera is one of 65 thousand of these species. Most are harmless, and they are free-living inhabitants of water and soil, which means harmless, that means they will never cause any kind of problem for you. They're supposed to be there in the soil and in the water, and they're part of the ecosystem. There are a few, a few species of parasites uh, that are protozoans, but they are responsible for hundreds of millions of infection each year, especially in third world countries and countries uh, where they do not have access to clean water that has been, you know, treated like we have here in the U.S. Um, and also where there's like not good sewage um, and anyway, so uh, poor living conditions basically. All right, so um, how do you get infections from amoebas? So we, we saw one of them, but there's, uh, all, there's different possible answers here. 
So as we talked about with CDC, uh, from CDC here with Nonclaria Falleri, um, what happens is that um, the cyst stage, which could live in the soil or in the water, the cyst stage is what it will do, for example, over the winter and all of that. And uh, when the waters are nice and warm, the little trophozoite um, will uh, break free from the cyst and swim around, and it will, um, you know, turn into this little flagellated form which swims around. But the trophozoite, if you happen to get the trophozoite or the little flagellated form into uh, into you, that goes uh, up your nose. So you're swimming around, think about jumping off cliffs and all that kind of stuff, and you get water up your nose, and there's an amoeba in there. That amoeba can go up in there and um, migrate to the brain and cause problems. So this is not the only way. Um, if you drank water, um, there are other of these, not specifically Nanglaria phalera, but there are other trophozoites um, in cyst stages of, um, you know, other protozoans that can cause disease if you swallow them and they get into your GI tract. And that would be you drinking water or um, ingesting water from the lake or purposely drinking water from a stream, freshwater stream or something like that. And you, of course, then ingest a cyst or a trophozoa. And that's what would happen in third world countries, right? Because um, they um, don't have clean water, so they'll drink the dirty water. Okay, what is a common amoeba that causes GI symptoms? There are several. So do you know of an amoeba that causes GI symptoms? Uh, put an answer there. And so they are three common ones um, that are that you can find here in the U.S., of course. We have uh, Cryptosporidium, this little guy right here, this amoeba right here. We have Georgia Lamblia, this little guy right here. And Georgia Lamblia, uh, it looks like a little face, and we call it the little professor because if you look, you know, sideways here, actually it looks like that, you see one nuclei, the other nuclei, so that looks like two little eyes, and it always has two nuclei. Uh, and that looks like kind of like a nose. This kind of looks like a mouth, really. And then the flagella around it kind of looks like a beard or hair or something like that. And so it's often called the little professor because it looks like a little guy, a little head. So that's Georgia Lamblia. And then Entamoeba histolytica is another one. Um, so this um, will give you, um, you know, amoeba-related diarrhea kind of thing that just doesn't go away unless you're treated, obviously, with the right medication. So you have to properly diagnose it. Uh, so uh, I've mentioned this already, but how can amoebas survive the harsh conditions like winter when they are in fresh water or in the soil? And so uh, amoebas have life cycles. And uh, the trophozoites are your modal feeding stage that require ample food and moisture and the proper temperatures and all that to stay active. So these are very active in the warm months or in warm uh, tropical climates and stuff like that. So, uh, and these are the trophozoite, for example, with Nagleria phalloros, it's, it's modal and feeding and active. That's the one that went in and caused the infection. But then when uh, you have winter time and adverse conditions or droughts for areas like in Africa and stuff, then um, these trophozoites can form a cyst where it takes all the genetic material and everything you know it needs and just encapsulates it. So a cyst is a dormant resting stage that occurs when conditions in the environment become unfavorable, like too dry or too cold. It is resistant to heat, drying, and chemicals, which means, um, like, if you treated water, it's not going to do anything. Uh, if it's in soil, it can be dispersed by air currents, so wind that blows can carry them off into different areas and drop them in water or other soil areas. Um, and cysts are an important factor in the spread of disease because um, it allows these um, protozoans to survive uh, from uh, during harsh conditions, and then when conditions are favorable, they go back to trophozoites and multiply, but they don't die off when the conditions are adverse. And so here is, again, another illustration of that. So you have the trophozoite, which is the active feeding stage, 
you have drying or lack of nutrients. The cell rounds up, loses its motility, can't move around. It just starts making a cyst wall. It becomes completely uh, mature cysts in its dormant resting stage and can stay like that for a very long time. And then when the cyst lands in an area or moisture returns or something like that, moisture, nutrients, all that are restored. The cyst walls break open and the trophozoic stage uh, is reactivated and it can feed and duplicate and uh, spread. Okay, so let's talk about one more case. No, well, there'll be two more. Uh, this is the next to the last case. All right, so you have a 38-year-old mission worker comes back from spending a couple of months in Nigeria. He comes back, he has fever off and on. He has a headache, vomiting, and jaundice. The ER physician suspects malaria. So malaria uh, will have signs and symptoms of headache, fever, fatigue, pain, uh, muscular fatigue, muscular pain, back pain, um, chills and sweating, dry cough, an enlarged spleen, uh, and possibly an enlarged liver, and uh, nausea and vomiting. A friend of mine had it, and he was in ICU. He had one of the forms that's resistant to treatment. They had to fly in, fly in a special drug to treat him once they properly diagnosed him with the right uh, species and the disease, you know, the drug resistant species and stuff. And um, he was in pretty bad shape. It took him a while to, to recover. He had a, a swollen liver, a spleen. Anyway, he was, and he was hurting and sick. It was really bad. Okay, so do you know what organism causes malaria? So what protozoan organism causes malaria? So enter your answer here. And the answer is, there are several, uh, but they are all from the species Plasmodium. So uh, you have Plasmodium vivax, as listed here in the table, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium malariae, and Plasmodium falciparum. And they each present slightly differently. They look, uh, the schizont phase we're going to look at, which is the phase inside the red cells, looks different in each of these species. The microgametocytes looks different in each of these species. Some of them are uh, inside the red cells, some of them are free. And the microgametocyte looks different. Some of them are inside the red cells and some of them are free. Okay. And the fever cycle is different also in each of these. And severity. So here is um, the last cycle of the malaria parasite. So this is kind of, again just general uh, for all of those plasmodium. So it would start. Uh, how do you get it? You get bit by a mosquito that carries malaria, the malaria parasite. So the mosquito bites the human and injects the parasite when it bite, bites the human uh, and get its blood meal. So uh, the little sporozoites, um, which I think will be a lower V form here, if you will of um, the plasmodium get into the bloodstream of the human and they will migrate and burrow up into the liver, uh, a human liver cell, a hepatocyte. And it has a stage there, so it's going to grow during the human liver stage. It's going to grow and grow and duplicate. And um, once they get so, there's so much of the liver cell can't contain it, that liver cell will burst and release these merozoite form into the bloodstream. So these merozoite form leave the liver and go into the bloodstream and they will enter into the red cells. So they will attach to a red cell and enter into the red cell. So once it has entered into the red cell, there are two fates that can happen. One of them, so uh, it's, you know, inside, it's made its way into um, the red cell and you, it can form male and female gametocytes. The mosquito bites the human again and gets these infected red cells with the gametocytes. And the life cycle here can continue. So the male and female gametocytes can, uh, are released from the red cells, which are destroyed. They uh, they can uh, couple and uh, make an oocnet, then an oocyst. So basically, they're making babies here. Here's so they combine, they make a baby. So just think of it, kind of like with humans, it would be sperm and egg, right? So here is just male and female gam gametes that join, 
um, and then amygdaloosis, which grows and grows and grows and uh, travels to the salivary glands of the mosquito, and the mosquito has these sort of sporozoites that can release them and it bites the human and it keeps that cycle going. Now there's another cycle that happens here with the merozoites is once they enter into a red cell is they themselves can grow in the red cell and do the same thing as it did in the liver cell here. They grow and grow and grow and form this gazant forms and uh, then release more merozoites which infect more cells. And so this thing of infected cell, infecting cells and growing and then bursting and releasing that process takes a certain amount of hours so it could be 48 hours for example and every time all these cells burst there's a bunch of them that happens all at one time because they all mature up around like this cycle sync so they all mature up around the same time you have this massive bursting of these guys and so you'll get a fever spike from the patient and then again they'll go infect cells and then you'll see again so this this fever cycle kind of goes along with these merozoites maturing inside the red cells and so uh on um, blood smears from these patients um so this is here a, a gametocyte form right there so this one's not contained in a red cell but then these little guys here are merozoites are either attached to the red cell or inside the red cell right and this right here is a platelet. So you can see it takes a trained eye to differentiate a platelet from uh, here, a gametocyte, a merozoite here that's, I'm sorry, a merozoite that's inside or attached to a red cell. Because sometimes platelets lay on top of red cells and they kind of look suspicious, but they're really only platelets. But uh, so you have to really identify it. It doesn't, it's, not the same look as a platelet but it's close and so it's it could be easy to miss it really does take a trained eye to pick up on the fact that these are red cells that are infected with malaria and not just platelets just laying around there and of course the mosquito to show that it is spread by mosquito bites Okay, and so um, here is another case. Uh, a two-year-old boy is seen by his pediatrician for his wellness checkup. This pediatrician notices that the toddler is scratching his diaper area a lot, so she orders a tape test. All right, and what do you think uh, the tape test might reveal? What do you think is causing this little boy's symptoms? This is a very common condition um if you have kids and they've gone to daycare more than likely you've dealt with this um because it's really common and it's easily spreads between kids and that is pinworms okay so enterobius vermicularis um and they form worms that can be visible to the naked eye but uh, we study them in microbiology one because they can cause human infections and two, they do have a stage um, that is um, seen that is microscopic. So when you do a tape test, um, they literally put some scotch tape to the anal area around about where it's itchy, okay? And uh, what it would pick up in, and then put it on a microscope slide and look at it is you would see these little eggs because what's causing the itch is little female worms will migrate to the anal area and lay their eggs in this area um, so that the eggs can go off and be spread. It causes itching and irritation. So automatically, um, you know, especially a toddler or a baby or, you know, kid was going to reach their hand there or preschooler and scratch because it's itching, right? And they just don't know better. And so therefore, um, how do you think they get it? How is it transmitted? So, uh, again, if you're a parent, it's probably going to be very easy for you to figure that one out. Um, so how are pinworms transmitted? And we're going to answer the question, of course. So uh, again, you have um, the male and female worm mate, and then the female is going to go lay her eggs. Um, and the little eggs emerge from the anus. It causes itching. Um, and so... Uh, the, the kiddo will itch their butt and then they will reinfect themselves unless you catch them and make them wash their hands and, you know, take them to be treated and stuff like that. Um, and so, so a lot of times it'll it takes treatment over time and it may even take more than one treatment. Um, and so if the, the toddler 
a preschooler scratches their anal area because it's itchy and does not wash their hands and then they handle toys or play with another child well then the eggs can be passed on to the other child and then if the other child even just puts their hand in their mouth eat a snack do something put a toy in their mouth that's contaminated then bam now they have the they swallow the pinworm eggs they the pinworm eggs will go to their gut area to their intestines where they will mature up into male and female make eggs, go lay the eggs, and the cycle continues and it can be spread. So obviously, um, you know, teaching kids to wash their hands before they eat anything, having them at a good daycare that where uh, they enforce hand washing and, um, you know, clean the toys and stuff like that. But of course, it, you know, with kids playing, it's almost impossible to keep them from getting that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, cleaning toys and hand washing, especially in daycare, can help prevent the spread. And then, of course, catching it uh, early and treating it uh, then breaks the cycle. Okay, so those were some of the most relevant um, of the eukaryotes that can cause problems here. Uh, we kind of went over kind of an array of them. Uh, if you have any questions, pop them here. Um, and our next lecture will be over viruses. Thank you for your attention.